30, 1990, and this is a recording for the California Social, Social Welfare Archives for the School of Social Work at USC. Our subject today is Jack Shakely, president of the California Community Foundation. And Jack, you just uh, said that you hadn't been recorded before for uh, research or this anything of that sort. What uh, led you into working in a social work atmosphere in the beginning? Uh, started out as an adventure. Uh, I was in law school and uh, back in the early 60s and uh, very much moved by John Kennedy and joined the Peace Corps mm. in 63 and got out in 65 and um, uh, the two years there had sort of turned my head about social change and community development and uh, then went into the Army, and interestingly enough, had pretty much the same job in the Army. I was doing community development kind of work, uh, uh, what they called in those days, uh, winning the hearts and minds, and uh, I worked on things that uh, pretty much just for social work nature. So by the time I got out of the Peace Corps in the Army, I was already almost 30 years old, and uh, uh, my pretty much, the die was already cast. Uh, I saw an opportunity to go into community development. I was actually working at the University of Oklahoma and got into uh, uh, fundraising and grantsmanship and and that sucked me into the nonprofit world uh, and I've been there ever since. You know, I enjoy it. Well you went through one of the, the, when was it that you went to the hospital here at the mental health hospital? Rest Haven, I went to Rest Haven in 1970. I had just been out in California for a couple of years. I, gotten out of the Army and uh, uh, moved out here in 1969 and was working at Martin Luther Hospital in Orange County. And uh, I was Director of Public Relations, Communications. They were doing a big uh, uh, consolidation effort of Anaheim General and Martin Luther and uh, there was some um, pretty strong feelings about that, against that. And uh, they brought me into uh, work with the press and, and uh, do some uh, publicity and public relations work and speaking engagements all over Orange County. And one of the people I met there uh, was a guy named Ken Stein, who became a very close friend of mine, who was uh, the head of the community outreach department at Rest Haven. And uh, uh, as luck would have it, Rest Haven had a position that opened up in communications mm. and development, and uh, I moved up there and I guess February or March of 1970. When did all of the altercations start? They just about <laughs> greeted me at the door. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember not more than a month after I got there, there was a protest by the uh, uh, predominantly uh, Japanese but Asian community um, led by a community activist named Mori Nishida um, that uh, accused Rest Haven of being in Chinatown but not being of Chinatown and that there were no Asian uh, therapists uh, on staff. Uh, all those accusations, by the way, were correct. Uh, uh, there was no Asian therapist, there was no Asian uh, of any kind uh, mm -hmm. on staff uh, at that time. Uh, so it was a very exciting period from the get-go for me. Well, it was very, uh, what shall I say, it fit in with the turmoil of the times. Very much so. There was a tremendous amount of uh, uh, community wanting to express itself, I guess, and also a tremendous distrust of institutions, whether the institution was government or military, uh, and Rest Haven was an institution. It was also seen as an institution that was uh, white uh, and elitist. Uh, that was a perception. and. Uh, so it was a natural target, a very natural target. It was only, you know, it was the only target, though, that the Asians went for, wasn't it, really? Yes, it was. was yes, it, I it mean, was. that was what was strange to me. Was Well, you know, I think that, uh, I, I'm going to look back on it, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but I, I believe one of the reasons why the demonstrations were so effective was that there was a posture on the part of the board and key staff to accept what the uh, community was saying. Mm 
Mm. Uh, there was a uh, very quick admission of the fact that the, uh, the staff was not ethnically balanced. There was a tremendous move to get that done. Uh, the board was expanded to, to, to bring in uh, the community. I think that the mistake that was made, though, uh, was that the same community activist who had raised uh, uh, much of the uh, problem uh, were invited to join the board. Mm -hmm. And very often, uh, mm -hmm. community activists serve as an activist role. They are destroyers, not builders. Uh, and I think that proved to be the case later on because mm -hmm. the organization finally uh, imploded and destroyed itself. Well, and, and didn't it come under pressure at that time, too, to, to change the services it had yeah. traditionally done? It had been a traditional psychiatric right. uh, inpatient setting, and uh, because it had recently gotten community mental health center monies uh, from the federal government, uh, it was uh, it was required to and wanted to go into the whole spectrum of mental health services, outpatient, mm -hmm. community outreach. We had child uh, and family uh, programs uh, under Thor Nelson that was off-site. We had uh, Rest Haven had always been innovative, as you know, Kay. It had done uh, work therapy and dance it's a therapy. Very successful agency. Uh, Twyla Tharp had actually started her career oh. as a dancer at. Uh, at Rest Haven, uh, and a uh, very successful inpatient setting, and it was run at the top by men and women who were very familiar uh, with a medical model institution, but unfamiliar with a community-based model institution. And I think therein uh, lay a lot of the conflict, because mm -hmm. some of the people, like Ken Stein, uh, who were the community uh, outreach uh, people, felt like outsiders in their own group, uh, and they would come swaggering in from the uh, outlands, uh, uh, you know, like grizzled uh, veterans in a war movie, uh, looking at the people who stayed in the hospital as if they were somehow uh, not on the cutting edge. And I think there was a great deal of tension internally uh, as to whether we were a psychiatric hospital devoted to patient care or a community mental health center devoted to social change. Uh, and I think both of those feelings were held very strongly by uh, members of the staff, and they were simply dichotomous. They, they couldn't work together. Mm. And they, again. What do, what do you think that that um, turmoil of that period, what were the gains or the losses? Well, there were very few gains, in my opinion. Um, the gains that were made were, were in the area of uh, program. Mm -hmm. um, um, Rest Haven did respond quickly to the call of the community uh, and created, for example, uh, a couple of Hispanic uh, uh, family uh, programs and uh, uh, group programs for in, in Spanish language. That was one of the first uh, Spanish language uh, inpatient groups uh, there was a uh, theory at the time that uh, Hispanics um, did not uh, uh, respond well to uh, basic European traditional psychotherapy, uh, which was a bunch of hooey. Uh, they just couldn't find any therapists that spoke Spanish. But then they did find therapists. And so when, when Rest Haven did it, that gave a lot of the other hospitals and psychiatric centers the impetus to do it. So there was a real trailblazing there, and I think that was very effective. Um, I, I, I think the other thing that Rest Haven was able to prove, unfortunately, was that community mental health centers uh, are financially uh, stepchildren, can't possibly make it on their own, must depend it for huge amounts of their support on government money. Mm -hmm. And Rest Haven moved from a strictly private sector psychiatric hospital that was receiving only modest amounts of government support and huge amounts of private support through uh, a very large uh, volunteer effort. Uh, they were good fundraisers. Uh, they were very good fundraisers. Mm -hmm. They had uh, uh, support groups uh, for young women, for uh, more mature women, for young men. It looked like the music center. I mean, uh, uh, they had uh, four or five dinners a year. They had all kinds of things. When the huge infusions of government money came in, though, 
a lot of the support groups, especially some of the women's groups, started saying to themselves, well, what, what does our $15,000 a year mean uh, when it's compared to $4 million or something from the state? And I think the art has started to disappear. Mm -hmm. But what we learned was, in fact, uh, uh, the private sector could not sustain that hospital. Uh, and uh, if you look now at the community mental health centers uh, here in Southern California, um, Rest Haven was the first to go under, but not the last. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been at least six others that have gone under. The ones that have not gone under, such as Thalians, is really only a community mental health center in name only. There's not an institution there. Mm -hmm. uh, they just do work and call it Thalians. Uh, Kedron is gone. Central City Community Mental Health Center is gone. Uh, San Fernando Valley Child and Guidance Center has now changed its name and changed its direction. Uh, Gateways is uh, gone, I think, uh, if not gone, pretty, pretty well so, I merged. Think, yeah. uh, uh, I think the community mental health experiment has proved itself to be uh, both successful and horribly expensive, and, and the government's not willing to pay for it. Hmm. Well, as they aren't in, in a lot of I the think that's mental right. health I think that's problems, true. too. As you well know, uh, the whole mental health picture is one where a person can look perfectly sane for years and yet be in real bad trouble. Uh, and you can look at it ten years in retrospect and say, oh, look, the, all the jobs he lost, all the fights he got into, the divorces, and so forth. Should have seen the pattern. Didn't see it. Uh, and if a person's in the middle of that pattern, uh, they really may be in desperate need, but there's no place for them to go because they may still be holding a job, although not quite the job they might have held. They may still be getting some uh, support, although not as much support as they need. It's a devilish, devilish situation or a series of diseases. Well, then the mental health uh, um, changes in, well, that was the 60s and 70s, too, when they... Uh, didn't want them in institutions anymore, but That's now right. we're reaping the results of that. <laughs> That's right, too. Oh, things have changed so much. I can remember that one of the... Rest Haven wasn't just attacked by the Asian community. It was attacked right, left, and, and, uh, and uh, forward. Uh, the gay community uh, mm -hmm. uh, made a concerted attack uh, on Rest Haven, uh, stating that they wanted to have uh, specific services for gays. Uh, and Rest Haven responded uh, by um, saying yes, but in a curious early 1970s way, they made homosexuality a disease. Uh, that infuriated the entire gay community, so uh, uh, they lost twice uh, in that thing. And I don't think they ever really recovered from that because the Gay and Lesbian Community Service Center started its own mental health center uh, shortly thereafter and, and, uh, and walked out. Where did you go after Rest Haven? <laughs> On a long vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I left Rest Haven in 1974, and uh, uh, I had been, for about a year, uh, I had been working kind of part-time at Rest Haven and part-time uh, in some consulting with uh, a local television station here and uh, 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 sort of just doing odd jobs, basically, in, in, uh, in grantsmanship and, and proposal writing and things like that. And uh, through that, we uh, formed, a group of us formed the Grantsmanship Center. Well, that's, that's yeah. what I thought. Yeah, and that was actually started in 73, and then I went full-time in 74 and stayed with them for uh, six years uh, until I came here. All right, now, what happened to the Grantsmanship Center? Well, uh, it, uh, it's, it's actually still around, although in a vastly different uh, uh, system. I'm becoming fearful. Virtually every agency I work for seems to go away, and maybe I'm the <laughs> kiss of death. Um, the Grantsmanship Center started, uh, as I said, in 73, when, as you remember, there were so many community-based organizations. During the war on poverty under the Johnson administration, tons of money came in the communities. Community-based organizations were started. But it took a while for the community-based organizations to, to understand they had to be administratively far better off than they were. They, they, they didn't know things about corporate funding or foundation funding or how to get support from the general public. So they were totally at the 
uh, at, the bequest, or at the behest of the federal government. And if they lost their federal funding, the agency was gone. Well, a lot of community activists decided that wasn't right. Uh, and that uh, community-based organizations should be able to play on the same level uh, field uh, as the big boys who were getting money from foundations. Uh, we knew corporations and foundations and church groups and uh, quasi-governmental units like the National Endowment for the Arts were giving away hundreds of millions of dollars, and we just didn't know how you, how you got it. So about a half dozen of us, uh, uh, probably so green and... and and not knowing what we were doing uh, was the only reason we could have started it. Created this organization called the Grantsmanship Center, and I traveled to, oh gosh, the first three or four years, I would travel to 35 cities every year teaching these four-day seminars. And every time I was there, I would make a point to stop and interview foundations and corporations, and the other five would do the same thing. By the time we got back in a couple of years, we had the largest collection of information anecdotally about foundations and corporations that anybody ever had. Mm -hmm. And we started a magazine called the Grantsmanship Center News, which was very irreverent. Uh, it didn't, uh, didn't like foundations by and large, uh, said they were non-responsive, and no one ever said that in print before. Uh, and it got us two things. It got us a lot of recognition, a lot of subscribers, but it also got us a lot of vilification on the part of the establishment at that time. Um, uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, uh, at that same time, the Filer Commission was uh, looking at philanthropy in America. This is 1976, and uh, we issued a minority report uh, at the Filer Commission uh, that the New York Times picked up and printed side by side. Uh, the Filer Commission had spent like $20 million in a year and a half, and we spent about uh, $37 in, in, in all of our travel. But uh, the Filer Commission, to its credit, then asked one of our staff members, Jim Abernathy, to come and spend a year with them uh, and give the community-based side. And uh, he did, and, and uh, from that was created a group called the National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy, who now uh, pokes sticks at me. Uh, <laughs> I feel like Dr. Frankenstein. But uh, there does need to be a gadfly, I think, or somebody who sees the emperor and has no clothes, and that was the... That was the task that we appointed to ourselves, the Grantsmanship Center, in the 70s. Uh, there was an awful lot of money in the federal government in those days, and state governments too, for training and technical assistance. And um, uh, so from the period 1974 to 1980, the Grantsmanship Center grew and grew and grew almost exponentially. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of money. Uh, and we're doing a tremendous amount of training programs, and we were doing... Uh, senior programs uh, for uh, advanced uh, people in the field, doing a lot of writing, publishing books, pamphlets, materials. And then in 1980, with the Reagan administration, uh, it all ended. And it ended uh, uh, with the blunt severity of a lead pipe to the head. Uh, almost all training and technical assistance money was the first to go. It's the softest mm -hmm. money anywhere. Uh, United Ways, uh, uh, cut back on training uh, uh, community development corporations cut back on training, economic development groups cut back on training, and uh, the Grantsmanship Center went from a budget of $3 million in 1980 to a budget of about $1 million in 1982, uh, but we couldn't, we couldn't contract as quickly as we had expanded, and uh, by 1983, the community, uh, uh, the Grantsmanship Center had uh, debts of well over uh, half a million dollars mm. and no prospects. And so in 1984, we decided to close it. But Norton Kiritz, who was the uh, uh, actual uh, founder of it, the fellow who had been the driving force behind it and put a lot of his own money into it, asked if he could buy it. And in California, you can sell a nonprofit corporation uh, mm. and make it into a private corporation if the person who's buying it will give a corresponding amount of money of the worth of that organization uh, to, to, to charity. And so we worked out a deal with the Attorney General that uh, Norton would take over the, the half million dollar in debt, mm -hmm. uh, personally accept that and absorb that and continue the center uh, as a profit-making corporation, which it is today. The, the magazine ceased to function uh, in 85, and uh, uh, 
the Grantorship Center now is um, pretty much where it was in 1972 or 73 when it started. Uh, uh, two or three guys going around the country teaching mm. these courses. And I hear good things about them, although I haven't actually been in the course in a long time. Well, that's interesting. It, uh... I think that, uh, I, I, I don't want to make this sound too political, but I think that uh, uh, we're just beginning to see the abject harm that the Reagan administration's budget cuts uh, placed upon this country. Uh, a lot of people were pretty smug about the fact they couldn't see anything bad uh, after the cuts were made. Well, that's because they, it takes a while for the infrastructure to destroy itself. Uh, but it's destroyed, and, and you know, the nonprofit organizations today are probably no better prepared uh, for uh, seeking funding than they were 20 years ago. Uh, I think that's true. And I think that uh, boards of directors of nonprofit organizations uh, um, are, by and large, uh, no better trained than they used to be. Um, some of the volunteer uh, organizations that have, that have uh, for years, been doing a lot of training find it difficult to find funding. The Center for Nonprofit Management here in Southern, here in uh, Los Angeles, struggles, uh, and. Uh, I think that it's something that uh, we're really paying for. Uh, we find so many of the small nonprofit organizations really can't compete. And, uh, we find ourselves here now at the Community Foundation providing technical assistance to our grantees. Uh, we give them some money, but we also say, oh, here's how you, how you set up your books and here's how you go about recruiting and so forth, because it's pretty raw out there. Well, I'd agree with that. Do you do you see any other differences in, from my own experience since retirement, I'm seeing differences in the way agencies operate. In other words, the motivations aren't the same, it seems to me. Do I you think notice that? I do notice that. I, I think that the same thing is starting to happen in the nonprofit sector that we're noticing in other sectors. There's a, there's a more bottom line uh, feeling. Um, you know, there's a good and a bad uh, part of that. Uh, uh, the nonprofit sector has been, for years, uh, uh, accused of poor management. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was a false accusation, frankly. I, I think that the nonprofit sector has gotten along uh, far better uh, than uh, people imagine. Case in point, is that for years uh, non-profit hospitals were accused of poor management. And if you remember in the early 1980s, uh, a couple of nationwide health chains that were proprietary, the AMI being the biggest one, made a lot of ballyhoo about coming in and taking over these non-profit hospitals and saying, we're going to make them pay, we're going to make them work. Well, AMI didn't make them pay, it didn't make them work, and they went belly up too. Um, and the fact of the matter is that AMI probably uh, ran those hospitals far worse uh, as a proprietary hospital than as a, a non-profit. But the newspapers only picked up the quotes from the chairman of AMI who said, we're going to turn these around and make them work, and uh, never really got around to reporting the fact that they were probably being run better as non-profits than they were being run as proprietary. Um, but, but at least that was the accusation. And I think nowadays, I just saw a, a Business Week article that did have a list of some of the best entrepreneurs and best managers in the nonprofit sector. Faye Waddleston at, at uh, Planned Parenthood and uh, Jim Joseph at the Council on Foundations. And I thought that was quite a uh, fascinating thing. So maybe it has enhanced a little bit this bottom line feeling, has had uh, an enhancement on administration. But I think in some cases it's also taken a little bit of the soul out of some of the organizations. Well, Do you agree say, with that? Yes. I, uh, in fact, that worries me. Me too. Um, I'm finding the staffs of agencies less centered on client and what the client needs yeah. than on their own salaries. Yeah. I think that's unfortunately true. Uh, and I don't know where the curve goes on that, uh, because in many cases, uh, even here in the foundation, we're having to compete with private sector. 
schools are having to compete with computer centers for math teachers and science teachers and volunteering has changed you know better than than anyone i could think of how much has changed most women these days work so the daytime volunteer business has has come a cropper there still is a large cadre of people doing volunteering in traditional areas like hospitals and so forth but i'll wager that the number of daytime volunteers is way down and i think that the evening kind of work is is up but i'll see a new type of volunteering volunteers now tend to band together and do things on their own but they do it entrepreneurially they don't go under the uh, any other organization uh, if they want to do scholarships they don't think about going to UCLA and saying could we help you raise scholarships they simply call create a new organization and they call it you know Los Angeles for youth and uh, uh, it, this proprietary volunteerism is something that's brand new to me. I, I never saw it before. And I see it all the time now. Well, and also the, what shall I say, the short-term, very visible volunteering and then yes. dropping out. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, uh, and I, I don't want to discredit any type of organization, uh, but I sometimes feel that the organizations that provide uh, a day at a baseball game or Disneyland for a terminally ill child is is really 19th century type charity. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not 20th century type philanthropy at all. Uh, it doesn't improve the condition of the youngster. In fact, many social scientists would argue that that provides a divisive wedge in the community and provides for sibling rivalry and guilt. Uh, but this and seems to be... it's an ego trip for the giver. That's exactly what it seems to be. Yeah. That's exactly what it seems to be, and and uh, that worries me a bit because I think that means that maybe those of us who are in the nonprofit sector and who've been in it for a while aren't reaching out and reaching over enough and grabbing a hold of these people and saying, look, there are ways to do it better. Uh, and we're looking for ways to fold people in, but we're missing them. These are people who are on the outside and going to stay on the outside. Jack, let me ask you, uh, uh, turning the subject around a little bit to another area that worries mm -hmm. me, is the public sector, government sector, now setting up its own nonprofit entities? Yeah, I, I gave a speech two years ago that said if the if these if all the governments and the schools didn't stop creating foundations, I was going to create a government uh, just in retaliation, but. Um, that worries me as well. Uh, I can't tell you the the number of failures in this area is just legendary. Mm. Um, um, in Los Angeles, Project Restore is a good example, where they tried to create a foundation to restore City Hall, and they found that most people gave it a huge yawn. They felt City Hall should be restored by City Hall. I mean, it's a government building, and they expected that the government would take care of it. Um, there was a whole rash as you know, of uh, uh, school, public school foundations being mm -hmm. started. And just as we predicted, the only ones who thrived were in San Marino, Beverly Hills, <laughs> Pacific Palisades, and Palos Verdes. Sure. But the ones in South Central LA or East LA, uh, where the need is greatest, they've all failed. Uh, money begets money, I guess. But um, I, I don't really understand the proliferation of the government foundations. I think it's a way to get private sector money and still control it by the bureaucrats, and it seems to me it's just totally uh, oppositional. Well, they blame, it all, they blame it all on Proposition 13, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, Prop 13 did have some problems, all right. Um, and they have, and Prop 13 has caused some some real uh, real problems. But I think that rather than, uh, I, I, I think that the government looked at it the only way the government perhaps could look at it, and that is we don't have enough money from the government. We've got to get more money from someone else. But what they might have should have looked at was they should have said, if we don't have enough money to do this, why don't we let somebody else do this? Uh, I think the parks and recreation department should have been privatized long ago. Um, we have a park here, and the Community Foundation owns a park. We maintain it. 
uh, and our cost of maintenance is about one third uh, of what the cost of the city of Los Angeles maintenance uh, is, and we maintain it beautifully. Uh, we have uh, uh, have not experienced the same kind of problem as many of the parks have. Um, I, I'm not anti-government, but I believe government should be a way for people to get things done, but not necessarily do things for us. Uh, public housing is a good example. I think that we've learned in the 70s and 80s that government cannot build housing. It can fund other people to build housing, but it can't build housing. And I think it can't run parks either. It can't run zoos. It shouldn't run mental health centers. And shouldn't run psychiatric hospitals. Uh, it ought to collect taxes and give it to the nonprofit sector uh, to run almost everything. Uh, by the way, that opinion is probably not shared by a lot of my friends. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I really think that the government, with all of these uh, uh, foundations and kind of fits and starts, uh, have expended a great deal of public money for almost little, almost nothing in return. The average American is not going to sit down and write a check uh, to his city. Uh, he writes plenty anyway, he figures, and uh, he gives it to taxes and so forth. And I think that uh, I think he would be far more willing to give money uh, to a private nonprofit organization doing the same thing because he feels a little bit more closely aligned with the people who are on the board or on the staff, and he feels he could be in somewhat more control of it. They don't have any success, these foundations. Of course, I don't, uh, I don't quite trust government saying they have no money because uh, every time uh, they had a, a cause that was politically nice to have, the mm -hmm. money was always there. Well, you know, one of the things that we, that we do learn, uh, we've, we've learned very, very distinctly, the government has a, uh, a very, very important role in this community this country, and that is the role of, of taking care of national security. You know, national security isn't just watching our borders for invaders from foreign soils. It's taking care of the national security, the people who put their money in savings and loans, people who fly on airplanes. Uh, if, if I fly on an airplane and there hasn't been an inspector of that airplane for a couple of months because the government can't pay enough money to put... Uh, uh, ins inspectors in the FAA, and uh, the top blows off of that airplane like they did in Hawaii, my security has been threatened as much as if a Russian had come into my backyard. Uh, and if I put money in a savings and loan association and Charles Keating steals it because there is nobody there to watch him do it, uh, my security has been threatened. And I think that what we have really seen uh, over the last decade is that the role of the United States government and state and county governments has become very clear. Uh, it really must protect the common wheel and should get out of building homes and should get into monitoring all these skid row hotels that are being poorly run and making sure that they're being well run. Uh, uh, the ability of, the, uh, of a certain tiny, tiny minority of this world to do desperate acts for money uh, is, is, is spellbinding. Uh, and, you know, when you look at and all the money that SNLs are going to cost this government, uh, it amounts to more than all the savings that were uh, enacted in the entire eight years of the Reagan administration times about 10. Uh, so, um, you know, I guess I'm getting off on, on, on uh, something other than just what we started out talking about, but I, I think that one of the reasons why right now that we're having an infrastructure problem is that we don't have the strong monitoring. And if the government needs that kind of money to do it, I don't think anybody in America would say no. Um, and, and leave the nonprofit sector to do all the social work uh, and, and all the human service work uh, and all the artwork for that matter. I mean, my gosh, this National Endowment for the Arts thing is tearing the art world asunder right now. Isn't that, that's an, an interesting phenomenon, too. It By really the is. way, whatever happened, remember when we were trying to get the arts groups to have a management center. Did, did you ever manage to get anything done on that? I never pulled that together, and we must have had meetings what, for two years, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I never was able to pull that together. Uh, the um, uh, four or five players were very, very seriously involved in it for a while, but then Los Angeles Theater Center got their place downtown, 
and they split off. And Bela Lewinsky uh, got a promise of all that money from Rob McGuire, and, and then they uh, they split off. Although here it is, seven years later, they still haven't built that built that dance gallery. Um, it was just very difficult to get a group uh, in place that could uh, um, feel strong enough to compete uh, with the music center, and uh, uh, so we never got it done. Well, I got such a kick out of one of the people that we were talking to who said, I'm not interested in any of this. All I want to do is get on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Which wasn't helpful yeah. at all That's on management, right. was yeah, it? I know, I know. <laughs> uh, Jack, when you, uh, did you find your past experience helpful when you went into this foundation? Very helpful. Um, because I'd been so involved in, in nonprofits, I knew what nonprofit organizations were looking for. Uh, I knew the kind of foundation they were looking for, and we tried to create that for them. Uh, the California Community Foundation had been uh, very quiet, uh, had been more of a function of a trust officer at uh, Security Pacific Bank. And really for only years. funded capital. Only funded capital. Uh, and so uh, uh, the, the board came to me and said, you know, we're tired of being called the typewriter foundation or whatever we were called at that time. We want to feel like we can make a difference in the community. And uh, so working with the board for about three months, we, we did come up with a complete new set of agenda, a complete new agenda, I mean, and a new set of gri guidelines and criteria for funding. And I held a meeting uh, in one of the downtown uh, auditorium uh, there, and we must have had five to six hundred nonprofit organizations in attendance. And I walked out on stage and said, guess what? We're not funding equipment anymore at all. And there was a sort of a rush of intake of breath all over the place. And uh, one person said to me later, he said, well, now you don't do general support and you don't do capital and you don't do equipment. He said, my God, he said, what's left? <laughs> uh, but we really started being a program-oriented foundation at that time. And uh, uh, I was able to bring on board other people who had worked with me, uh, not necessarily at the Grantsmanship Center, although it turns out Jennifer Leonard and Harvey Chess did. And, and uh, a few others, uh, but people who, who knew not just grant making, but who knew what it took to run a nonprofit organization. And so the Community Foundation, I think, pretty quickly became seen as a partner rather than an adversary uh, in the whole funding program. And that's what we wanted. We didn't have that much money. You know, when I came on board, we had $19 million in assets, and only about seven or eight million of that was unrestricted. So at the best, we could give away a half a million dollars a year. Uh, we're giving away now an unrestricted about uh, four million dollars a year, uh, and total grants of about nine million. So uh, we've really grown. But but at that time and even now, we really have to posture ourselves as being um, sort of an advocate for nonprofits. Uh, we have our library. We do a lot of training programs. Uh, I really didn't want to have the Community Foundation seen as standing apart. And I think my background really gave me that opportunity because I'd worked with so many of these organizations, uh, if not by name, uh, by type, mm -hmm. in the Grantsmanship Center. And I knew what their expectations were. And I also knew after looking for 10 years at other foundations how frustrating it could become uh, to have people not have their mail answered and things like that. So I think it was a tremendous help. Tremendous help. At what point did you separate from the bank? Just about six months after I got here. Hmm. Uh, and I had come into the foundation with the pledge on the board that that would happen. Um, and I think Security Bank, frankly, was uh, uh, acting in a very heroic fashion because you don't see corporations giving up territory uh, very often. And this was territory. Uh, mm -hmm. Although I think that uh, they didn't make any money on the community foundation. They saw it as a prestige factor. They saw it as their foundation, but uh, we got the uh, we got the uh, bank convinced uh, to uh, spin us off. They gave us about a two hundred thousand dollar grant to to buy uh, new letterhead stationery and new brochures and all those things uh, when we moved and got us in the new quarters. And um, uh, we really took off uh, after that. Uh, Eighty one was really the launch year. For us, and uh, interestingly enough, and this doesn't have any application to anybody else except community foundations, but by doing that, 
we grew so swiftly that Security Pacific's assets actually grew uh, faster than it had been growing before when they were the exclusive dealer. Mm. Yeah, we, we really, uh, a lot of the people had been uh, fearful that uh, if they gave the money to the Community Foundation, it would just go into Security Pacific somehow and be lost. So by our breaking off entirely, it really changed that philosophy. Well, and, <clears throat> and there's a, well, the cited definition with uh, people can make very specific kinds of definitions of their money. Very true, and I think that even, uh, I had uh, a lot of hope for community foundations. Well, I, I really wanted to come here. Uh, I'd been studying community foundations for years. I wrote a big article. When I say big, I mean about a 50,000-word article on community foundations back in 77. And I really wanted to uh, run a community foundation. And the fact that it was there was one right here in my backyard that I frankly thought at the time wasn't being run very well uh, was just irresistible to me. And I would tell you that I used everything I could think of to get recognized so I could get this job. I really tried to get it. And it's been extraordinarily rewarding. I think community foundations, by and large, are a good thing for the community. They're flexible. They can change like crazy. You know, one of the problems that the United Ways have is that you get a group of agencies. That group of agencies depends upon the funding. The last thing they want to see is 200 new agencies come on and share in that wealth. And yet, the, uh, there was a recent study by the Asian Pacific uh, uh, group that said there are only seven Asian-specific organizations uh, in the United Way, mm. uh, out of um, some 320 agencies. Well, that's just not enough. And uh, and yet, getting to be a United Way agency is very difficult. Community Foundation can change overnight. It can do all of its grants in 1989 to Hispanics, and all of its grants in 1990 to Asians, if it feels like it. Uh, we wouldn't move so swiftly. But community foundations across the country have been able to move very swiftly. And I like being in that sort of thing. I like being able to be in the hunt uh, from a nonprofit perspective. You know, we were the, one of the first uh, organizations to fund AIDS back in '84, uh, and uh, we were able to get into the amnesty program very, very quickly when that uh, uh, law was passed in '86. And we're looking now at affordable housing, so we have a lot of flexibility in movement. I, I love being in a community foundation setting. And well, and, and it uh, it gives you as director a lot of freedom that you wouldn't have in a lot of other settings either. That's exactly right. We don't, you know, we have we have over 300 funds here. Not a single one of the funds represents more than about two percent of our total assets. Mm -hmm. So we're not beholden to any particular person, or corporation. Uh, most of our donors leave us money through wills and bequests. So. Uh, much of the money is, is pretty much unfettered. Uh, so we do have a great deal of flexibility to move where the community wants us. And we can go into loans, we can go into the arts, we can go into mental health, uh, just wherever it looks like the need is greatest. And I like that because I can look at the community now from a perspective that says I don't have to look at it as an education, as an edu educator. Or I don't have to look at it as a mental health professional. Uh, I can look at it as, uh, I hope, uh, a fairly objective community organizer uh, who has some bucks. Uh, you know, nothing better for a community <laughs> organizer to have, <laughs> not only to have the ideas, but to have the money to get it done. Uh, that's, that's a dream come true. So. I, I had to, uh, Ann Shaw's on your board, uh -huh. and her comment was, it was so nice to be on that side of the table. I know. <laughs> You know, the, the difficult part is that there's never enough money. Yeah. And uh, we have to turn down people and agencies that are top notch, just wonderful ideas because there's not enough money. But, uh, and Ann and I have talked about this, Ann Shaw and I, uh, uh, if you get the combination of the right idea and the right people to do it, to be able to actually put money into it and see it work is a rare thing. Uh, and, and We've had that more than once, and that really feels good. Oh, sure. Uh, that's yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Okay, Jack, do you want to say anything more on this tape that you think of? Gosh, I, I don't know. I, I uh, You know, one of the things that I hope uh, uh, 
you know, the, the United Way is going through a renaissance right now, I think, uh, a rebirth, and the Community Foundation is still just reaching its real growth. We'll hit $100 million sometimes this year and sometime this year. And, but $100 million looks like an awful lot when it used to be $20 million. But for a community this size, really the California Community Foundation should probably be $500 million. Mm -hmm. And I think that the United Way uh, should be raising $200 million a year instead of $85 million a year. So we've got a long way to go, but I feel it. I, I feel something good happening here. Uh, and I am an eternal optimist, of course, uh, but I wasn't terribly optimistic in the early 80s or mid 80s, and, and I'm far more so now in the 90s. Uh, uh, I think LA is going to uh, really take some giant strides toward uh, helping its neighbor. And I'm glad I'm part of it. Well, and I think it's Los Angeles is so unique in, in its diversity and its. Uh, intercultural kinds of things that it's an exciting place to be. It really is. Uh, I'd rather be here than anywhere. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, Kay. Well, thank you. Okay. I appreciate your time. And this will be very helpful to have this in the archives.